thank you very much for the introduction, for the opportunity to speak in this seminar. And I think my, my talk fits nicely into the topic of the seminar because it's not only a scalar curvature and my talk is not about scalar curvature. But uh, in, of course, there's relation to scalar curvature uh, because these boundary value problems have been used a lot to study scalar curvature lately. Um, I want to give a relatively, so this is really a colloquium style talk. I want to give you an overview and a working knowledge uh, concerning the analysis of these boundary value problems. I'm certainly not going into technical analytic details uh, today. And I also think that's not what most of you uh, would be interested in. Um, there's a lot of literature on boundary value problems, uh, also for Durac operators. Uh, I should uh, you list a long list of references. I'm not going to do that. I want to present uh, my view of the things, which I think is very, yeah, is quite exhaustive and uh, and uh, general. Um, my presentation uh, is based on joint work with Werner Balmer. So let me start by uh, looking at a, an elementary example that illustrates some of the phenomena that arise when you look at uh, boundary value problems for, for Dirac type operators. Namely, let's look at the unit disk in the complex plane. And the operator that I want to, uh, to look at is just the del bar operator. So solutions to this equation will be just holomorphic functions on the unit disk. And the boundary of the unit disk is the circle. And then there is an, an adapted operator on the boundary, on the circle. I will explain later what I mean by an adapted operator. Uh, and in this example, uh, this adapted operator can be chosen to be just the usual operator differentiating in the angular direction along the circle, up to a factor of i to make itself a joint. Um, so that is the setup. So let's look at that and let's look at uh, boundary value problems for, for this, for the del bar operator. So if you have a function on the disk, you can of course look at its Taylor expansion. That's the usual Taylor expansion that you see here. And if you have a function on the circle, you can look at its Fourier expansion. That's what you see here. And if the function on the circle on the boundary is actually the restriction of a function on the disk, then the coefficients arising in these uh, series are the same, right? So you just uh, insert, you replace z by i to the by e to the i theta, and then you arrive at the corresponding Fourier expansion for the restriction to the boundary. Note that the Fourier expansion is nothing but the expansion of a function on the circle with respect to the eigen modes of this operator, right? So the, the, the spaces uh, that uh, we expand the function on is just the basis of eigenfunctions for this operator. Now, let's see um, what kind of boundary value or boundary condition could we impose in order to get a good problem, for example, in order to get a Fredholm operator. Um, for second order operators, uh, one of the classical boundary conditions would be Dirichlet boundary conditions, which would just ask for the restriction to the boundary being zero. But for a first order operator, that's too strong. And uh, so we want to have a half as a strong boundary condition uh, in this case. So let's put half of the restriction to the boundary equal to zero. And in fact, the atia patoti singer boundary condition is exactly doing that. So the atia patoti singer boundary condition says if we restrict to the boundary and we look at the corresponding Fourier expansion, then we do not impose all the coefficients to be zero, but only the coefficients that correspond to non-negative eigenvalues. So those are equated to zero. Now in the particular case, that uh, your, your that function on, on the boundary is actually the restriction from something on the disk, you notice that uh, negative modes will not appear anyway, because if you look at the Taylor expansion, there are only non-negative powers of Z. And so the uh, Fourier expansion of the restriction to the boundary will also only have non-zero contributions from non-negative ends. And if I put all those equal to zero, then uh, of course I put everything to zero, which says that the kernel under these boundary conditions is actually trivial, right? And uh, in fact, uh, in this particular case, you get a Fredholm operator of functions on the disk under these boundary conditions to functions on the disk. So that's, uh, that's a good kind of boundary condition. 
naively, you might be tempted to say, well, if I can do this for the positive modes, I can also do it for the negative modes and equate those to zero. So let me call those the anti adiabatodicine boundary conditions. And uh, that, that would be demanding that the coefficients for negative ends are equal put to zero. But as I said earlier, this would not actually impose any additional condition because those co coefficients do not appear anyway from if the thing comes from the restriction of a function on, on the disk. And therefore, this would lead still to an infinite dimensional kernel, and we would certainly not uh, arrive at a Fredholm problem. So the upshot of this uh, simple example is you may, so the right thing to do uh, for Dirac type operators is indeed to put half of the restriction to the boundary equal to zero, but you have to be very careful with which half you put equal to zero. So the thing is certainly not symmetric under, um, under positive and negative eigenvalues on the boundary. Okay, so that's just a simple example to, to indicate some of the phenomena that might occur. And now let me uh, explain uh, the, the, the general setup of the situation that I want to describe. So we start with a complete Riemannian manifold and we with boundary and the boundary is supposed to be compact. Um, many or very often the manifold M is also just a compact manifold, but there are also situations uh, where this non where we allow M to be non-compact. And I will give you an example at the, towards the end of my talk where this uh, becomes relevant. So M itself need not be compact, but the boundary has to be compact. Okay, and then we fix two vector bundles over the manifold and look at an operator mapping sections from the first vector bundle to the second vector bundle. And for now, this operator should just be a first order differential operator. So for instance, it can be a Dirac type operator mapping positive chirality spinners to negative chirality spinners, for instance, or something like that. Uh, so that's uh, the setup. I want to assume that the principal symbol of this operator is bounded uh, with respect to the Riemannian, complete Riemannian metric. If the manifold M is itself compact, that's a void condition, then I don't have to talk about this. Or if the operator is a Dirac type operator, then it's also automatic, right? So that's not, uh, not a, a very restrictive assumption. So that's uh, what we have on the manifold. And now on the boundary, I need to have an operator which maps sections on the boundary. Note that the sections, this now maps sections of E to E, whereas the operator D maps sections of E to F. So, and why is that? Because this adaptedness of the operator on the, bound, uh, on the boundary means that the principal symbol of this operator A can be expressed in the terms of the principal symbol of the operator in the interior by this formula. So it essentially the principal symbol of A is equal to the principal symbol of the operator D, except that we have an inverted term here coming from the principal symbol of D where you in, uh, insert the unit conormal, let's say the exterior unit conormal uh, into, uh, into the symbol. And this, um, may, this way, uh, uh, this maps E to F, but this maps F back to E, and this is why this is an operator mapping E to E. So that's the uh, the condition. That's the compatibility condition between uh, the operator in the interior D and the operator on the boundary A. So that's and now here comes the actual assumption. Namely, I assume that this operator A is a formally self-adjoint operator. If D is a Dirac type operator, then A is also a Dirac type operator. And then you can choose uh, the A to be a formally self-adjoint operator. There are other situations, however, where D is some other kind of operator, for example, the Rari Tashwinger operator, then A cannot be chosen to be self-adjoint. And then this uh, whole setup needs to be modified. Maybe if I find the time, I say a few words about that at, at the very end of my talk, let's see. But as long as you are just interested in Dirac type operators, it's not a problem. Right, then A is a Dirac type operator and D is a Dirac type operator and all these assumptions are satisfied. Okay, good. So for Dirac operators, everything is fine. And now we do the same thing uh, for the uh, formally adjoint operator to D. Then we get a similar boundary operator A tilde for the adjoint, which then maps sections of F to F. So that, yeah, D star maps F to E and A, A tilde then maps F to F. 
so we make just the same assumption for the for the adjunct operator. Okay, now this uh, boundary operator is uh, supposed to was assumed to be formally self-adjoint. The man the boundary is a compact manifold, and so A has a unique self-adjoint extension. There, therefore, we have functional analysis or functional calculus available for this uh, self-adjoint extension of A. In particular, we can in particular we can insert uh, we can insert. Um, the uh, operator into uh, the characteristic function of non-negative real numbers. So that's this one. So that, and uh, this gives me an operator, which is just the projection onto the sum of all eigenspaces uh, to non-negative eigenvalues. Uh, that's the P plus. So since A is a self-adjoint operator on a compact manifold, it has discrete and real spectrum. And we have this L2 expansion, and uh, this operator P plus just is the is just the projection onto the sum of all eigenspaces to non-negative eigenvalues. So that's what we now have well defined. So if A was not self-adjoint, maybe we wouldn't know what to do at this point. Okay. And now here is the general atia patodi singer boundary conditions. It says that we look at sections such that their restriction to the boundary when inserted in this projection operator, this is zero. Or in other words, we only allow sections of E for which the restriction to the boundary uh, only is a sum of eigenfunctions to negative eigenvalues of the boundary operator. So this is the classical atia petodi singer boundary condition. And um, in, indeed, if you have if M itself is a compact manifold and D is a twisted spinorial Dirac operator, then uh, under these boundary conditions, D is a Fredholm operator and the index can be expressed in topological or geometric terms. And here the, you see the formula. So the index of the Dirac operator under these boundary conditions is given as an integral over the manifold M of a certain quantity, which we know from the Classical Atiyah Singer index theorem on closed manifolds. It's a hat class times the churn character of the twist bundle. And then there are two boundary con uh, com uh, contributions to the index formula. One is local in nature, just as the interior part, this is the red part. So that's an integral over the boundary of a transgressed form uh, coming from this inner integrand. This part vanishes if you assume, as is often done in the literature, if you assume that your operators and metrics are product near the boundary, then this red part is gone. And uh, But you always have this spectral contribution, H plus eta. A, this is uh, coming from the spectrum of the boundary operator. H is the dimension of the kernel, and eta is the, the well-known eta invariant. So the eta invariant, uh, you certainly know the eta invariant, I assume that uh, it's given by the non-zero spectrum of the operator, where you look at this zeta function uh, related to the non-zero eigenvalues of your, of, your, of your operator on the boundary, you extend this function meromorphically and evaluate at zero. So that gives you the eta invariant. It's a, a measure of the asymmetry of the, of the spectrum because if the spectrum is symmetric about zero, then the, the whole eta series is vanishes and therefore the eta invariant vanishes too. Anyway, so this is the classical Atia petodi singer index formula. So that's very nice. We have an uh, a operator and we have a, a nice formula for, for its index. And what I'm concerned about today is which other boundary conditions work besides Atia petodi singer. So what's the most general boundary conditions that you can impose and still get a good reasonable theory and I will make precise what that means later. So that's that's what I'm concerned with. All right. And uh, in order to describe uh, the structure of these boundary conditions, let me introduce a bit of notation. So if you have an interval in the real numbers, uh, then let me write as L2 of the boundary with respect to this interval, the sum of all L2 functions on the boundary or sections in a, in a vector bundle. So I, 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 I sub, um, suppress the, the vector bundle in the notation now. So I take all sections, L2 sections, which can be written as linear combinations of eigenfunctions of the boundary operator for eigenvalues sitting in this interval, all right? 
Um, note that this definition, of course, depends on the choice of operator A. So there should actually be an A in, uh, in this notation while well, I'm also fixing A once and for all and suppressing this dependence. So um, uh, if your J, if this interval is equal to the whole real line, this is just the whole L2 space. And similarly, you do this for Sopolev spaces uh, on, on the boundary. The boundary is a compact manifold, so there's a unique and well-defined notion of Sopolev spaces for all Sopolev differentiability degrees S. S can be any real number. And uh, these Sopolev functions can also be expanded into these eigenfunctions. It's just the convergence is of a different kind so of the series. So I can do the same uh, thing for Sopolev functions. All right. So that's just a piece of notation. And with this uh, piece of notation, I, <clears throat> I can now rewrite the Atia Petodi Singer boundary conditions as demanding that the restriction to the boundary of some function it has to sit in this subspace where I only allow negative eigenvalues here. So the interval that I choose in this notation is the interval from minus infinity to zero excluded. So that's uh, a reformulation of the Tia Patodi single boundary conditions. And I call this uh, for now B as like boundary condition. I'm using uh, regularity H one half here because later my domain will consist of H one functions in the interior. And then the restriction to the boundary will give you H one half functions on the boundary. That's the usual trace theorem that you may have seen. Restrictions of H one functions are of regularity H one half. That's why you have H one half here. So in case you may wonder. All right, so that's the APS boundary conditions. And now I'd like to generalize those. And I could give you the definition, the general definition of an elliptic boundary condition, but that would be quite um, technical and uh, would may, maybe knock you out. So that's why I'm doing the following. I want, I'm going in three steps. Uh, each step, I'm going to generalize the boundary conditions so that in the end, we arrive at the general definition, okay? Uh, so we want to get, go a somewhat softer path here. Okay, so the first generalization <clears throat> is why do we have to cut the spectrum at zero? In fact, we don't. Uh, so we can replace the interval from minus infinity to zero by the interval from minus infinity to any number. So that's the first generalization. Whether you take a closed interval or an open interval doesn't matter because you can always place this cut A somewhere between two eigenvalues, right? So, well, you can take an open interval or a closed interval, it doesn't matter. So, but we always have to go from infinity, minus infinity to somewhere. So that's certainly something we can do. So we can replace the, bound, the IPS boundary conditions by everything which is spanned by eigenfunctions to eigenvalues less than or equal to some number A, for instance. So this is uh, called generalized APS boundary conditions. So that will also work and everything will be fine for such boundary conditions. Okay, so that's the first generalization we, we are allowed. The second generalization is um, to a certain deformation that we allow. That's maybe the most technical part. So we start, so rather than looking at functions only in one such half space here, we look at a graph of functions where the a graph of a bounded linear map G, which maps this space into its complementary space. So this G is something which is defined on this spectral subspace and maps to the complementary spectral subspace. It's supposed to be a bounded linear map, and it's supposed to preserve Sobolev regularity. And then we replace our original spectral half, half space here by the graph of this map G. Uh, so we, we look at all the set of all vectors V in this spectral half space plus G of V, which is sitting in the, in the complementary space. That's a generalization because you can, of course, always take uh, the map G equal to zero. If you take ma the map e G equal to zero, then you are back to your uh, generalized APS conditions here. So, but uh, you can think of this as a deformation uh, of your uh, spectral subspace into something sitting more diagonally 
between your um, your spectral subspace and its complement. So that's that's the crucial somehow the crucial generalization. And now there's a third step, namely we are in addition allow adding uh, or subtracting finer dimensional subspaces. So we may look at such we may look at such a graph as described before and then add something which is finer dimensional and has good regularity so it should be consist should consist of smooth functions for simplicity so those are the three steps the first one is we allow for spectral uh, spectral cut not just at zero but anywhere then we do this deformation by replacing the spectral subspace by a graph and then we allow modifications by finite dimensional spaces so that's the three things we allow and now i can give you the complete definition of an infinite regular elliptic boundary condition, which I will abbreviate by infinite regular elliptic boundary condition as here. So what is it? It's a closed linear subspace in the Sobolev H one half of the boundary, such that we have a splitting of our L2 space on the boundary into four spaces. Two carry a minus index and two carry a plus index here. And uh, this, uh, the, the, the Ws are finite dimensional spaces and sitting in uh, and consisting of smooth functions. So these are just finite dimensional modifications. And, the, and uh, so the, our boundary condition will have one of these finite dimensional parts and it will, and the rest will be a graph of the type uh, described before. So that means um, uh, this uh, this is a graph of a, of, a, of a bounded linear map G from V minus this part to that part uh, as, def as defined before, but everything on H one half regularity. But may I ask something, yeah? Sure. Is it correspond to what you're doing classically, but then some Lagrangian subspace? Is it Lagrangian for some symplectic structure? It's not necessarily Lagrangian because you can always um, finite dimensional error up to finite dimensional. It error. will be, yeah, it will be Lagrangian in the self-adjoint case. It will okay. be Lagrangian with respect to a principal symbol in the self-adjoint case. That's actually a characterization. It's not always Lagrangian. So there is a natural Lagrangian here, but it's not always Lagrangian. And it is Lagrangian if the uh, operator and the corresponding uh, boundary conditions are adjoined to one another. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yes. Um, all right. Um, good. So that's the general the general setup. And um, now let me add a few, or let me list a few facts about this kind of boundary conditions. And one, so and then uh, let's go through some examples. So I want to set up a Fredholm problem. So then I have to say precisely what is the domain of the operator and and what's the range of the operator. So if I have such a boundary condition, such a space, let me call by DB the, the operator D with the following domain. As a domain, I take all L2 sections such that if I apply D to it in the distributional sense, then I get again an L2 section and the restriction of my section to the boundary must lie in this subspace. Of course, you have to prove that this makes sense that uh, in this situation, you can actually restrict to the boundary, but it can be proved, okay? So that this makes sense. And uh, then I look at this domain, and of, of course, my operator maps this by definition of the domain, it maps it to L2. So that's that's the operator I'm looking at, and I'd like to have a Fredholm operator uh, with, these do with this domain and this range. And uh, first, before discussing the, the, um, the Fredholm property, let me discuss regularity. That's also important because if you solve an equation under a boundary uh, with boundary conditions, then you want to have that this solution is smooth up to the boundary so that certain integration by parts are justified. Often you want to insert this into a Weizenberg formula and then on a manifold with boundary, you have to do some integrations by parts. So you get certain contributions on the boundary and this needs to be justified. So you need to have sufficient regularity of your solution, right? That's why this is important. And uh, the statement is that if you have such a, such a boundary condition as I described before, then your function F is in the Sobolev K space K plus one on M if and only if the image under this operator 
is in 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 the in the subvolume space K. I mean, one direction is clear. If it, if f is in K H K plus one, then d of f is in H K. But the point is that you also come back. In the interior of the manifold, this is just the classical elliptic regularity theory. So the point is really that this holds up to the boundary. And uh, for this, you need this uh, this assumption. Uh, or the, the, or the boundary condition needs to be of the form that I described. And in particular, you can, I can do this for all k. This means that uh, f is smooth up to the boundary. If and only if, when you apply d to it, then the result is smooth up to the boundary. So in particular, if d f is equal to zero, then you can conclude that f must be smooth up to the boundary if the boundary conditions are of the form as I described them. Okay. So that's the first thing. And so that's, of course, what you want, right? So you want to have it to be sure that solutions to your boundary value problem are, are, are good also at the boundary. That's the first thing. And now let's come to the Fredholm property. And here I have to, uh, I have to um, make an assumption at infinity since I did not assume M to be compact. So I need to assume in order to get a Fredholm operator, I assume that my operator is coercive at infinity. And what does that mean? It means I can find a compact subset in my manifold and a constant C such that each F which is supported outside K, outside this compact set, that the F can be bounded in L2 by D of F. Uh, if the manifold is compact, of course, this is a void condition because then you can just put K equal to M. But if K M is non-compact, uh, that's a relevant condition. And typically you can get this from Weizenberg formulas. If you have an, a Weizenberg formula for a Dirac operator such that the potential, like scalar curvature, is uh, uniformly positive outside a compact set, then uh, you will get this kind of, of coercitivity at infinity. Okay, so that's the assumption that we make in order to get uh, to come to a Fredholm uh, property. And here's the result. Now, if we have such an elliptic, uh, infinite regular elliptic boundary condition. And uh, my operator and its adjoint are coercive at, coercive at infinity. Then the operator under these boundary conditions with the domain that I described as from the domain to L2 is a Fredholm operator. So that's more what we want. Okay, so good. And um, here is then you, if you look at the index, uh, you may want to have a, an explicit expression for the index as we have seen it in the Atiyah Patodi Singer boundary uh, in the Atiyah Patodi Singer uh, index theorem. And uh, often uh, what you can do is you can reduce to the classical <coughs> Atiyah Patodi Singer boundary condition by modifying the, by modifying the boundary conditions. And um, the crucial thing behind this is the following observation, which is not deep, but very useful. Namely, if you uh, have two boundary conditions, B1 and B2, they are both elliptic in the sense I described. One is contained in the other, so one is stronger than the other. Then this can only be if the quotient, so if basically they differ by something finite dimensional, so the quotient is finite dimensional, and then you have the obvious formula for the index, namely the index for, for the weaker boundary condition is given by the index of the stronger boundary condition plus uh, this dimension of the of, of the difference in quotes. So that's uh, then, for example, using um, if you look, want to know the index formula for generalized atiyah patodi singer boundary conditions, where you just shifted the spectral cut, then uh, this quotient can be identified with the sum of all eigenspaces between the two cuts. And so the dimension will just be the, the, the sum of the multiplicities of the eigenvalues between the two cuts. And then you can uh, reduce to the classical atiyah patodi singer uh, formula um, by, by adding this correction term, for instance. So often you can use this to uh, reduce your computation to the classical APS index theorem if you are dealing with, uh, with, Dirac, with Dirac operators. OK, and now it's uh, time to, uh, uh, to uh, discuss examples. So the first example I've mentioned already, it's generalized up at uh, the single boundary uh, conditions. So uh, I just want to show you how this fits into the general framework. In this case, there are no finite dimensional contributions. 
Uh, one of the, the negative V is the negative spectral subspace at some cut, and the V plus is the positive spectral subspace at some cut, and the map G is equal to zero. So there's no deformation to a graph. And then the V is just the corresponding <clears throat> H one half space uh, to the corresponding spectral cut. So that's the generalized IPS boundary condition. So that's we have seen earlier. Another interesting case occurs when you are able to do a local boundary conditions. That's not always possible, but uh, often it is, and uh, it has actually been used in some of the uh, in, in some of the work that we have heard talks about in this seminar already. And I think this will also be used in the talk by Simone Cecchini later today. So this is. Um, this says that classical elliptic, local elliptic boundary conditions in the sense of Lopatinsky Shapiro are also of this form that I described. So this is a very classical theory uh, for the for local boundary conditions. And here is one instance where, where, where this can be dis, um, applied quite easily, namely if your, your bundle restricted to the boundary splits into two sub-bundles, E prime and E double prime. And in such a way, that the principal symbol of your boundary operator interchanges the two, so in particular they have the same the same rank. Uh, then, uh, then uh, the sections, the H one half sections in one, one of the two bundles, uh, in either one of the two bundles, form an elliptic boundary condition. So this uh, this uh, leads to these MIT boundary uh, conditions or to the, uh, in case of, uh, of the Euler operator to absolute and relative boundary conditions, that's of this form, right? So uh, this is contained in this general theory. So that's the, the local boundary part. And let me give a third example, which uh, I find quite nice. And um, this is the following situation. You start with a manifold M, it, M may or may not have boundary to start with, but you have a certain hypersurface in your manifold M. And now we can produce a manifold with boundary from that. So the hypersurface has to be compact. Now we can produce, uh, should be separating. So now we can produce a manifold with boundary from that by cutting the manifold along this hypersurface. Then we get a manifold with boundary and the boundary consists of two copies of this hypersurface M. And now I want to set up boundary conditions on this manifold with boundary that imitate the uncut situation. So these are the matching conditions. It's simply as follows. So my boundary space in which boundary values have to sit are such that the restriction to N1 has to coincide with the restriction to N2. So they are of the form phi comma phi, where phi is a section of N. That's the matching conditions. So if you have something which is defined on your original manifold M, you will have something which is defined on M prime, which satisfies the matching conditions. If the matching conditions are satisfied, you can certainly get something continuous on M by identifying the two boundaries. And since the things coincide on the both boundary uh, components, then they fit together continuously on M, right? So you can go forth and back between M and M prime uh, if you use these boundary conditions. And I just want to convince you that this is also of the form uh, uh, that I described earlier. It's um, an elliptic, uh, infinite re elli regular elliptic boundary condition. And here are the spaces that you have to choose. You don't even have to read this now. Uh, I just wrote it down to convince you uh, that uh, this is also of the form that I've given you. So in this case, you need these finite dimensional contributions because um, they take care of the kernel of the boundary operator. If there's a non-trivial kernel, and the other parts can be put together. And you also need this deformation map G here, which is then uh, such a, uh, this matrix. So it's just an elementary exercise to check this. Uh, so I'm only giving this, not that you read it, but uh, to uh, convince you that these matching conditions are also of the form that, uh, um, that I'm describing. And in fact, this is an example of a boundary condition which is not pseudo-local. It's not uh, described by pseudo differential operators. And much of the literature on these boundary value problems is uh, done by people working in pseudo differential operators. And they always look at pseudo differential things only. That's, that's what, the, what they want to do. And this, this uh, will not be uh, you know, covered by that theory, but it's, uh, it's in our theory. And let me uh, try to convince you that this, an that this is actually an interesting uh, condition to look at. Here's an application uh, to it. 
Namely, if you look at this matching boundary condition, then we can, what we can always do whenever we have a boundary condition, we can take this operator G and deform the operator G back to zero. So we replace G by S times G and let S run from zero to one. Uh, this way we can find a deformation within the space of elliptic boundary conditions. And the good thing is then if we have an index, uh, if it's Fredholm, then this is a continuous family of Fredholm operators so that the index will not change if we do that. So we can always do that if we have a non-triple G. So let's do it in this case. So if we do it, so if we look at a one parameter family of boundary conditions, GS, then for S equals one, we have the matching conditions. And for S equals zero, we have the atia Pattori single condition. If you look at it, right? Then you're back to the, the spectral subspace, in fact. So we have, in this case, an interpolation between the matching conditions and atia Pattori single conditions. And uh, this means that the index of uh, my manifold when cut open M prime was the manifold that I get from M by cutting uh, along the hypersurface. So if I look at the index with the matching conditions, this must be the same as the index with uh, a tier Padoe Singer boundary conditions because I have continuous family between them. So the index cannot change. On the other hand, uh, but the matching conditions are such that they give you the same thing uh, which you have on the uncut manifold. So that means the, uh, the index of the original manifold can now be described as the index of the manifold with boundary, but with APS boundary conditions. And now this implies the relative index theorem by Gromov and Lawson by a very natural argument. So remember, the relative index theorem deals with the following situation. You have a non-compact manifold M1 and a non-compact manifold M2. And outside certain compact sets, they coincide. So the, there's an isometry between the metrics, bundles, and operators, et cetera. So outside a compact set K1 in M1 and the K2 in M2, we have these two pieces, which are the same, basically, right? So that's uh, that situation. And now we assume coercivity at infinity so that both of the things have an index. And the relative index theorem in this non-compact situation expresses the difference of indices in terms of uh, integrals over these uh, compact parts. And let me prove it to you. <clears throat> Namely, so if you look at the index of the first manifold and the index of the second manifold, we can apply this, uh, what we did, uh, we can apply uh, to both of these manifolds what we just did. So the uh, index of the uh, manifold M is the same as the index of the manifold when we cut, when we cut this hypersurface which uh, is the border between the compact part and the non-compact part. So let's do this for M1. Then we have an index for K1 with atia Pattori with APS conditions, plus an index of the complement of M1 with also with APS boundary conditions, and similarly for M2. And this is subtracted. And now since these non-compact parts are the same, their indices are also the same, so they cancel. And therefore, we are left with the APS index of K1 minus the APS index of K2. And now we can just apply the classical APS in the, uh, index theorem that I showed you in the beginning and express this in terms of an inter interior integral. So this is for the Dirac operator in terms of an inter interior integral plus boundary terms. But the boundary terms for both these contributions are the same because since uh, on the non-camper part, everything is the same. So the boundaries are the same. The second fundamental forms are the same. So the boundary contributions cancel in this difference. And we are just left with the, with the interior integrals for K1 and K2. And that's the statement of the relative index theorem. So I think this is a very transparent way uh, to, uh, to prove this index theorem. And uh, in fact, um, here are some references uh, that I wanted to show you if you are interested to get a bit further into this. Um, the first paper is uh, the one that contains all the details if you really want to go through the proofs. The second paper, Guide to Boundary Value Problems, is more of a survey type uh, where we just refer to the detail for the details for the first one. So if for first start to get into these boundary value problems, you may want to start with the second paper. And um, and then if you get if you really want to know everything, then you go back to the first paper. And um, then there's a thing that I mentioned in the beginning. I made this assumption that the operator on the boundary 
is uh, a self-adjoint operator. This is good for Dirac operators. For Dirac operators, uh, the boundary operator is again a Dirac operator, and so everything's fine, it's self-adjoint. But there are other situations where this doesn't work. And in fact, it basically, Dirac operators are basically the operators for which this works, more or less. And uh, for example, the next simplest elliptic operator that you may be interested in is the so-called Rarita Schwinger operator. That's an operator on uh, three half spinners. And for this operator, it's impossible to find an adapted bounded operator, which is formally self-adjoint. And then, well, then you don't know really what to do. And let me just mention a few things since I have two minutes time, um, uh, what, you, what you can do in this case. If D is an arbitrary first order elliptic differential operator, then you can still find, write down an adapted operator as I did, but it's no longer self-adjoint. However, you can show that the spectrum is um, lies in a double sector around the real line. So here we see the, the, the complex plane. That's the real line in the complex plane. And the spectrum is not arbitrary. It's complex in general. It's not, but it's not arbitrarily distributed. It lies in such a double cone. Moreover, you can show that uh, the resolvent of this operator has a certain decay property when you integrate along certain contour curves. This allows you to set up a functional calculus uh, using certain um, contour integrals. Uh, this is known in the literature as H infinity functional calculus, so that you can still make sense of things like Atiyah Pathodi single boundary conditions. So if the spectrum is not real, of course, you may wonder, well, what would APS boundary conditions mean in this case? And also you have other problems like you can have a non-trivial Jordan normal form so uh, popping up, so the true eigenspaces to an eigenvalue may differ from the generalized eigenspace, et cetera. All this kind of trouble can occur and does occur in examples, but it can be dealt with by a, a more sophisticated machinery called the H infinity functional calculus. And then uh, you can um, have set up a, a, also a, a good and valid theory for, for these, um, uh, for, for index theory, uh, boundary regularity, et cetera. But then it's more involved uh, because I, uh, you have to make, it's more technical to, to even describe what APS boundary conditions are, et cetera. So we have more spaces involved, but it's still possible. And it, uh, that says uh, uh, for general elliptic first order operators, you can uh, give this general description of elliptic boundary conditions for which you have good boundary uh, irregularity properties in, in the Fredholm operators in the theory and so forth. And so my time is up and I hope you got something out of my talk. Thank you.